We're in the desert of En Gedi. The Bible talks a lot about it. Saul hid here in caves from David. And Jesus spent a lot of time in the wilderness. And here in John 15, when Jesus talked about the vine, he talked about gardening a lot. And so Jesus said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. You remain connected to me. I'm the source of life, the foundation of our life. We can't find life outside of Jesus anywhere. So this is one of the places where Jesus would have been referring to when he's talking about the beauty of the vines and we are the branches and we stay connected to him. Well, howdy Church Project, good morning. So good to see you, love to be together with you. Would you please open your Bibles and to uh, John chapter 15. Uh, John chapter 15, if you own a Bible, bring it with you to church. We'll use it here. If you don't own a Bible and you cannot buy one for yourself, we'll give you one before you leave today. If you don't have one with you, there's one under a chair close to you. Somebody would gladly pass it to you. John chapter 15, we study through books of the Bible here. If, you knew, we, if you're new, we believe that what God has to say is better than what we could come up with on our own. So we take books of the Bible and just walk verse by verse through them. We're continuing a conversation Jesus is having right before he goes to the cross with his disciples. John chapter 15, we're picking this up today. In verse 10, please read along with me. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends, if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command, love each other. Verse 10, if you obey my commands, you will remain in my love. Jesus is in the previous sermon last week as we studied the verses before this. Here again, he is connecting, loving him with obedience. Obeying Jesus seems to be a lost art of Christianity. We talk a lot about grace. Talk about a lot about the works of Jesus, but obeying Jesus is something that seems to be not talked about as much. Yeah, Jesus here is saying that love and obedience are completely connected. If you love me, he says in these previous verses, and again here, you'll obey me. Jesus wants us to obey him. Now, some people are reluctant to talk about obedience when it talks about following Jesus because we think it tarnishes grace. Well, grace and obedience, they can't be commingled, right? As if we're working toward our salvation, working for our salvation, if we're obeying Jesus. If we talk too much about obedience, it must mean that we think we have to earn our salvation, or if we don't obey enough, we can't keep our salvation. Well, to help clarify that that's not true, Jesus here says something pretty profound. He says in verse 10, if you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. Jesus wasn't obeying to keep salvation. Jesus wasn't obeying to earn his way to heaven. Jesus was obeying the Father because he loved him. We obey because we love him. That's what Jesus is saying over and over. If you obey me, if you love me, you'll obey me. If you love me, you'll keep my commands. Jesus says, if you love me, you'll be doing what I told you to do. Because loving Jesus and obeying Jesus go hand in hand. And some of us have abused his grace and we have said, he he saved me by his grace. He secured me for eternity. And while I live in this world, I can live however I want to. And it's an abuse of his grace. Now, some people also abuse grace by saying, Jesus needs me to help him with my salvation. And so I'm going to help him keep my salvation by being good enough, long enough, and not doing enough of the bad things. And so Jesus here is saying, look, I'm also obeying. I'm not obeying to keep salvation or earn salvation or even to be in good standing with the Father. I'm obeying because I love my Father. 
And Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey me. Last week, we understand that loving him was remaining in the vine is a phraseology that he used. And it would mean that you love him to keep close to him. And it gets us to a place to where we learn to hate disobedience because it causes distance. There'll be a place in your life, if you follow Jesus long enough, there'll be a place in your life that you get to, to where you would say, I love him so much, I love him more than this sin, and this sin in my life is causing distance. And so we learn to hate disobedience because it causes distance. There's a parallel example for us in scripture that we don't see practiced very often. It's hard to see it practiced publicly. In fact, I don't think it should be practiced publicly. I've seen it misused and abused or neglected. But in the Bible, there's this idea called church discipline. Again, it's been really wrongly used. Um, but the, the beauty of church discipline is this, that somebody was so connected to the fellowship. Picture um, uh, an environment where most of culture does not accept Christianity, but there are, is a small pocket of people in a little town, and these people are followers of Jesus, and this community of believers is so closely connected because the only way they can live with other Christians is in tight community, and so they're in fellowship with one another, but one person in the community decides that they love their sin. They want to live outside of the way of Jesus, they want to live outside of the will of Jesus. They don't want to follow the words of Jesus. So they start living in a lifestyle outside of the ways of Jesus. And so they get disconnected from this fellowship of believers. And the idea of church discipline is that this person would love the fellowship so much that they would, they would hate their sin in comparison to loving the community. And so they would repent of their sin. And they would return to community because they love the fellowship with the community more than they love their sin. And at some point in your life as a follower of Jesus, you would say, I have grown to love Jesus so much, I love him more than this sin, and this disobedience is causing distance. So I hate my disobedience more than I love my sin. And so Jesus is saying here, I want you to show me that you love me by obeying me. And, I'm not, and he, he clarifies here, I'm not asking you to obey me to earn salvation. I want to stay close to you. I want to have intimacy with you. I want to be close friends with you. And disobedience causes distance. Therefore, we would hate it. And Jesus, let's, re, let's be reminded of his original calling to us as followers of him. In fact, the last thing he said before he ascended into heaven, Matthew chapter 28, we call it the great commission. He said, go into the world and make disciples, baptizing them and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded. So the idea of you being a follower of Jesus and me being a follower of Jesus was that we would be baptized in the faith, meaning that somebody would lead us to faith in Jesus, and then we would learn how to obey Jesus in every area of our life. Discipleship really is somebody helping somebody else, they're leading somebody to Jesus, and they're learning how to follow Jesus in every area of their life. That's why when I'm discipling someone, I sit down with someone in a conversation, I talk about how are you following Jesus in your marriage? How are you following Jesus in your singleness? How are you following Jesus in your purity? How are you following Jesus with your possessions, with your generosity, with your giving? How are you following Jesus with serving and using your gifts to build the church? How are you following Jesus in your parenting? And so this is a discipleship conversation, teaching them to obey everything I commanded you in every area of my life that Jesus would be leading me. And so this is what we're doing. This is what we said yes to, what we signed up for when Jesus called us. He said, follow me. And so it's about obeying him. And that's what Jesus said here in verse 10. Read it along with me again, if you will. If you obey my commands, you'll remain in my love. You'll stay close to me. And I stay close to my father by obeying my father's commands. And he says in verse 11, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Jesus said, I, I want you to have joy. Jesus has a lot of joy. He's got a lot of joy. Jesus is full of joy. He's a source of joy. Now, some of us are confused by that because the only images we see are maybe a painting of Jesus with long, conditioned, curly hair, and he looks really sad in the dimly lit room that he was painted in. But actually, Jesus has a lot of joy. He, he's not losing joy. It's not leaking out. He's not having to go to a counselor and say, I feel like I've lost my joy. Jesus has a lot of joy. He hasn't lost any joy. He's full of joy. And in fact, he wants you and me to have the joy he has. 
When we talk about joy, we sort of understand what it is. It's, it's hard to articulate, just like it's hard to really describe any emotion perfectly, but joy is something, it's attached to happiness, but it's deeper. In fact, James chapter one says, consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. Like you can even have joy in the middle of a trial. Surely you met some crazy people who have joy even when life is horrible. And something about that, there's something about joy. And Jesus said, I want you to have joy. In fact, Jesus had joy all the way to the cross. It says in Hebrews that for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. It's possible for you to have joy in every season of your life. And Jesus loves us so much, he wants to give us joy. And here he says, if you obey me, you'll remain in my love. And obedience actually is linked to joy. In fact, I would say this, every act of disobedience is an empty search for joy. Every act of disobedience is an empty search for joy because we believe that Jesus is a source of joy and he wants to give you joy. And every time we disobey, it's, it's an empty search for joy. We somehow think that they're out there somewhere beyond Jesus, there's more joy. It goes back to the original sin when Satan himself in the garden with Adam and Eve questioned God and made Adam and Eve question God and say, I really don't know that my best life is found obeying the will of God. And they stepped outside of the will of God, searching for something more. And some of us are looking for joy outside of the will of God. We're looking for it in pleasure. We're looking for it in possessions. We're looking for it in power. And none of those things will give you joy. They're not all bad, but they can't provide joy. And anything outside of the will of God Anything outside of the way of Jesus, anything outside of the words of Scripture, they cannot give you joy. Jesus loves you, and he wants to give you joy. And he says, the only way you can really have joy is if you obey me and remain in my love, and then I can give you joy. Amen. My son, Ty, is turning 13 next week, and for his birthday, he wanted to go to the Rockets game with some friends. And so the last home game before his birthday was this past, this weekend, like Friday night. And so, you know, we decided that we we're going to let Ty get some friends. So we picked all these kids up from school. They ended up spending the night. I recommend that you don't do that with a whole bunch of 12 year olds, but it was fine. We lasted. And so we're at the game and they're all having a good time. We pick them all up from school. They come to our house. We crowd in, you know, the car and all their luggage. And then we, we make them take showers because they smelled horrible after sports and then and they didn't want to, but we made them. And so then we go down and we had a meal and then we go to the Rockets game and my son Ty is sitting at the end of this row with all of his friends and I, at some moment in the game, I just look down, I see him laughing and all of his friends having a good time and it just made me feel great that my son was having a great time and I got to provide this moment for him. And I think in the same way, on a much deeper and different scale, our Heavenly Father has joy and he wants you to have joy. Amen. He wants to give it to you. Yes, and joy is possible. And on this side of heaven, we're not gonna have unpolluted joy. We're suspended between heaven and earth. Just like our planet is suspended in nothing in space, it's just hanging out there, don't get scared, you know, but we're, we're hanging out in nothing. And we're suspended in space spinning on our axis at a certain distance from the sun, revolving around it annually. Just like we're suspended in space, we're suspended between earth and heaven. And we got a little bit of heaven and a little bit of hell here. And we're looking forward to the day where in Jesus Christ, like all aspects of sin and the residue of that would be gone and we're just in a pure state. But now we're in, in between, like Jesus said, in this world, you're gonna have some trouble. And we're not gonna have unpolluted joy here, but there's more joy for you than you now have, and there's no joy for you outside of the will and ways and word of Jesus. So Jesus said, I have joy, and I wanna give it to you. I have joy, and he said, I want your joy to be complete. I want you to have it more fully than you have it now. And I'm convinced that there are many of us here who are settling for lesser things in life, and we're missing out on greater joy. Jesus said, I have joy. Do you see it? Verse 12, uh, verse 11, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. It is a joy for Jesus for us to have his joy. And he wants to give it to you. It's not contrived, fake happiness. It's something deeply settled in our soul. And we know that we are walking in the best way possible to live. It's this connection to Jesus, and it all comes through obedience. I'm going to obey Jesus, not to earn salvation. There's nothing joyful about that. But because of my salvation, because he loves me, 
I want to love him back by obeying him. Verse 12, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Well, I, I, I thought all of these were commands. I thought all of this was from you. Well, it is. I mean, any, you know, anytime we read something in the Word, we, you know, hey, this is authoritatively given to us by God. And anytime we see Jesus saying something, we especially perk up. But when Jesus says, my command is this, we got to listen. I command you. In fact, he said, look, he's starting this conversation off here. Uh, if, if you love me, you'll obey my commands. Um, you're going to get joy if you obey me. He said in, in the week before, you're going to get closeness to me if you obey me. He even said you're going to get power in your prayers if you obey me. You're going to get fruitfulness. I'm going to reproduce myself through you if you obey me. Just stay with me. Stay in the vine. Stay close to me. I'm going to produce other fruit through you. You're going to have powerful prayers. You're going to feel closer to me. You're going to be closer to me. And I'm going to give you joy. But here he's saying, for example, here's the command. You want to obey me? Obey my, you, you love me? Obey my commands? Here's the command. Love each other. Some of us are like, great, I'm doing that. I'm doing pretty good at that, right? Like, you know, I, I got all the commands down. I'm not killing people. I'm not selling crack on the corner. I'm doing pretty good. I got all the commands down. No, Jesus is like, I'm going to give you the greatest command. Love each other. Love each other. Now, some of us feel like we're doing pretty good at that. Some of us really don't care about it. But... Let me just say, like especially this year, in an election year, I'd really like us to practice this. Like I, ha I have twitches thinking back to 2020 and the way I felt like, wow, so many of us failed in loving each other. When you think about loving people, for most of us, there would immediately come to mind people we wouldn't love. And, and, and Jesus says, hey, I want you to love each other as I have loved you. And so when we hear the word love, we get different ideas of love. You can walk into Target and read on a shirt, love is love, and say, what, what does that mean? It's so esoterical, it's stupid, it doesn't really mean anything at all, love is love. Well, actually the Bible says God is love, and no one can define love better than the source of love, and God is love. And so when you say, I'm loving people, what does that mean to you? Well, what does it mean to Jesus? Because Jesus said, I want you to love other people in the same way that I've loved you. And for some of us, it means one end of either spectrum. One end of the spectrum is love for me means affirmation and acceptance of all. All beliefs, all behaviors. Well, that doesn't seem like Jesus. Jesus wasn't approving of all beliefs or all behaviors. Jesus didn't come into the world and say, hey, I am, the, I am one way to get to God, but however you want to get to God is fine. No, Jesus actually said, I am the only way to get to God. I am the way and the truth of the life. Nobody gets to the Father except through me. So Jesus wasn't approving of every other way to get to God. And, and Jesus wasn't approving of people's behavior. In fact, somebody that was caught in a sin, Jesus looked at this person and said, hey, I'm not condemning you, but I want you to leave your life of sin. And so Jesus isn't approving of sin, and he's not approving of other ways to get to God, but some people define love as, I accept everybody's way, I accept everybody's beliefs, I accept everybody's behavior. And then the other end of the spectrum for those of us are, I will only love somebody if they believe like I believe and behave like I behave. So many of us are not loving many people, and we don't love somebody if they don't believe like we believe, and they don't behave like we behave, and even further, some of us don't love people who don't look exactly like us, which I think is horrible. I mean, he, Jesus left heaven and came here, and we don't look like him. I mean, he's like shining radiant light. You're not. I mean, he, he, he's the source of belief, and we're completely we're far from understanding and believing exactly right. Jesus is holy and pure and righteous and perfect, and we're not. So he left heaven and came here and stepped into a place with broken people who are not complete yet in their belief and who are not perfect in their behavior. And Jesus said, I want you to love people like I've loved you. I'm not approving of behaviors, and I'm not approving of different ways to get to God, but I stepped into your world where you lived I loved you before you believed in me. Romans 5, 8 says this, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we're still sinning against him, Jesus died for us. So before we believed and before we behaved, 
Jesus loved us. So who are you not going to love? Is there a certain color of skin you're not going to love? Is there a certain country you don't love? Certain languages you don't love? What about beliefs? You're going to love a Buddhist? You're going to love a Muslim? What about behaviors? Can you love somebody who's gay? Can you love somebody who's addicted to drugs? Stealing from their family because of their addiction? Can you, who, who, can you not, who can you not love? Who, who right now can you say, I, I, I can't love that person? Jesus says, if you love me, you're going to obey my commands. And then he says here twice in this passage we read today, this is my command that you love each other. And some of us are like, I can't love people who don't believe like me and behave like me yet. And I'm like, Jesus, well, Jesus said, you have to love each other as I have loved you. And he loved us when we didn't believe like him or behave like him. In fact, this, this very convicting verse for me in Romans chapter 2, verse 4, God's kindness is intended to lead us to repentance. Yet many of us, on behalf of Jesus, are jerks for Jesus. Jerks for Jesus. Like, I, I mean, I, 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 um, I'm just going to, like, you know, cut this off of the past this year, Right? Let me just say this, if you, like, um, if you can't love somebody who believes differently than you or behaves differently than you, then don't post a church project thing on Sunday and be a jerk for Jesus on Monday publicly. I, I'm embarrassed. You know, just don't bring Jesus and don't bring this church into your jerkiness, right? Just don't do it. And look, I... I actually have a lot of refined political views. I, I actually have opinions. And I think they're fairly informed intellectual opinions. I have ideas about things. I, from what I do, I, I feel like I can't fully express those all the time because my goal is to get people to Jesus, but I have ideas and I have thoughts. But I, I at the right time in the right place, I say the things I need to say and I, I mark and measure my words. And you as a follower of Jesus should have some restraint. And your filter might be, okay. Thank you. You who are clapping, I'm going to test your clap a little bit later. So just, you know, <laughs> clap cautiously. <laughs> but there, there should be some restraint. And the restraint should be, am I, am I sh somehow showing love even in my comments of sharing my opinion? Am I, am I being loving while I'm sharing my opinion, is it possible, let me ask this, to love somebody that I disagree with? Because the Lord loves us, and I'm pretty sure he disagrees with a lot of us. That doesn't mean he's approving of us, of our behavior. Go and sin no more. doesn't mean that he's saying always get to God. No, he's pretty exclusivistic, absolutely exclusivistic. I'm the only way, but he's loving. I just wonder if our filter would be, I mean, because he, he wraps this passage up again in verse 17, he says, this is my command, love each other. He says it twice here. Hey, if you love me, obey my commands. Here's my command. I'll say it twice. Love each other. Better learn how to love people. If you want to obey Jesus, if you want to follow Jesus, and I'll tell you what, if you want to have joy, you need to figure out how to love people. Because I would say the people who are coming across the hardest and the meanest are the people who have the least amount of joy. And you know what? I may actually agree with what you're saying. You may be right. You probably are. If it matches with my opinion, you are right. I know that you're right. I completely agree with you on what you're saying. But if you're not saying it in a way that can also love people and make people feel like they can get love from you, you've lost your joy and you're not obeying Jesus. So let's just not have a horrible year together as a church, all right? Let's just learn how to love each other. And if you wanna obey Jesus, you gotta figure this out. And I gotta tell you, for every one of us in this room, there's something about that, that the Holy Spirit who lives inside of us, if we're a follower of Jesus, would be saying right now, you have to learn how to love people better. That doesn't mean you change your opinions on things. It doesn't mean that your convictions change at all. That just means I'm going to be kind to people so that at some point I can have an open door to lead them to Jesus and teach them how to follow Jesus in every area of their life. Some of us have shut down opportunities to have a good God Gospels conversation because you care about things more than the gospel. Ain't nobody clapping. 
I thought I'd test, I thought I'd test that clap. Let's move on, because we should. So if I stay any longer, I'm going to start processing my grief from three years ago, and I shouldn't do that publicly. Verse 13. Jesus said this, greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Jesus is about to, and before the end of chapter 17, it's gonna become so clear to his disciples what's about to happen that they're gonna start grieving already. He's, he's, been, he's been slow to reveal to his disciples what's about to happen to him. But here, because the cross is imminent, He's sharing very clearly with them. And so in this verse, he's foreshadowing his own crucifixion. He's saying greater love has no one than this, that he would lay down his life for his friends. So here, here's the progression that we're seeing in this conversation with Jesus. If you love me, obey me. If, if you're obeying my commands, my command is love each other. So loving each other means laying down your life. And I'm going to do the greatest act of love by laying down my life on the cross for you. Greater love has no one than this than he would lay down his life for his friends. So Jesus said, you love me, you'll obey me. My command is to love each other. The way that I'm going to love each other, the way that I'm going to love you is I'm going to lay my life down for you. But Jesus isn't asking us to go to the cross. I mean, can I, am I loving less because I'm not crucified? I mean, because it hasn't happened. It hasn't happened here. I mean, you know, we haven't been crucified for our faith here. Maybe it'll happen one day, maybe not. The persecution is happening around the world. Thankfully, not here yet. Let's continue to protect that by the way we vote. Okay, anyway, I digress. You know what I'm saying? So let's continue to protect that. But what I'm saying is, Jesus said, here's the greatest act of love for each other. You need to love each other. I'm commanding you to. If you love me, you will. And here's the greatest act of love for each other. Lay down your life for your friends. But then he, he's, he, he compares what he's going to do on the cross for us in the very next verse. What does he say in the very next verse? You are my friends if you do what I command. So Jesus is telling us here, I'm not saying that you need to go to the cross for me. But if you are my friend and you do love me, you're going to do what I command. This is how the Apostle Paul said it. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. He said, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live but Christ lives in me. The life I live in this body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The Apostle Paul said, I've already died. I died to myself. And here's what happens in your life, in my life as a follower of Jesus. We get to a point to where not only do we hate disobedience so much because it causes distance between us and the Lord, but here's the deal. Like we... We just have the Spirit of God in here speaking to our spirit, calling us to die to ourselves. Jesus was crucified for us, greatest act of love. And what did he say? I mean, the next verse, he said, this is what I'm asking you to do. You are my friends if you do what I command. Nobody has greater love than they would lay down their life for their friend. You're my friends if you'll just do what I command you. If you'll just obey me in every area of your life, that's what I'm asking you to do. Crucify yourself and obey my commands. This is what Jesus is calling us to do. And it feels pretty simple. Jesus said, hey, baptize them, lead them to Jesus, and teach them to obey, help people learn how to follow Jesus in every area of their life. That's what you and I signed up for in Christianity. Now some of us are like, I didn't sign up for that. Well, what did you sign up for? Some religion? Some rituals? No, Jesus never came for that. He signed you up for following him. He said, follow me, and I'm going to make you into a fisherman. You follow me, and I'm going to change your life, and I'm going to use you for myself. And he carries that thought on in this next verse. Look at what he said. Verse 15, I no longer call you servants because a servant doesn't know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends. For everything I've learned from my Father, I've made known to you. I believe Jesus is saying here, not everything I've known about God, because he, he knows it all. But I think he's saying, in the flesh, in this world, I took on all your human limitations and I set aside the full rights of my deity. Philippians chapter 2 teaches us a little more about this more clearly. But Jesus says, everything I've learned from my Father walking in this world, led by the Spirit of God, I'm sharing with you. So if you obey me, here's what's going to happen. If you obey me, you're going to be close to me. 
and you're going to have powerful prayers. And you're going to have joy if you obey me. And it's going to show me that you love me just because you obey me. And now Jesus is saying right here, he's like, I'm going to reveal things to you. I mean, surely you know this as a follower of Jesus. I, I mean, I'm closer to the Lord than I was 20 years ago. 10 years ago, five years ago, two years ago. I, I, I know more and understand the more Lord, Lord more now than I did before. And hopefully a year from now, two years from now, five, I will be understanding the Lord more and walking more closely with him. I mean, this is a progress of revelation. Jesus says, what I learned from the Father, I'm gonna make known to you. I'm gonna reveal things to you. You're gonna learn about me if you walk closely with me. I mean, what a gift that we have this revelation, this ongoing growing in our relationship with God. And Jesus said, look, this is my friendship with you. My friendship involves full disclosure with you. You're not just servants. You don't just work for me. You're my friends. And the closer we get, the more we know each other. And the more, the more you pursue me, the more I'm going to reveal to you. And so this beautiful, this is a love conversation that Jesus is having with us. In verse 16, wow, so full. You did not choose me but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. You didn't choose me. Jesus chose us. You didn't choose me, Jesus said, I chose you. You didn't get to a place in your life where you're like, I've sort of figured this thing out. I know how to get to heaven. And I'm gonna go after Jesus. No, the Bible says that our heart was dead, it was sinful, it was set apart for ourselves. And somehow Jesus chose us. It's by his grace we've been saved through faith. It's not a gift. It's not from ourselves, our own works. It's a gift from God. Jesus says here, you didn't choose me. I chose you. What love is this? I mean, while we were still sinners, he died for us. We're, we're sinning against him and he died for us. You didn't choose me. I chose you. Romans 5, 8 says this. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. Like, he loved us before we loved him. And why did he choose us, it says here? I chose you to appoint you to bear fruit. I wanted you to go and bear fruit. I have appointed you to bear fruit. What is fruit? Well, it would just be, I'm reproducing the life that Jesus put in me. I'm doing that within others. I'm bearing fruit. I'm showing what the life of Jesus is like, and I'm reproducing it. I mean, imagine that any tree, any, any tree that bears fruit that doesn't reproduce, it dies. And Jesus spoke about that last week. You're, you, it, it, it's like your life is meaningless. It's like it's worthless. You can just throw it into the fire because you're not reproducing any fruit. It's just going to die. And Jesus says, look, I, stay close to me. Obey me. If you do, I'm going to give you joy. I'm going to give you closeness. I'm going to help you produce fruit. And I'm going to answer your prayers powerfully. I mean, do you see this at the end of this verse as we close? Look at what he said. I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. It's like fruit that's eternal, some of your translations would say. Like, I want you to be a part of stuff that's going to last. I want you to be a part of something that's eternal. I want you to touch heaven from here. And many of us are bearing fruit. I, sure, you're producing stuff. But is the stuff you're producing, is it going to last? Is it eternal? Is it touching heaven? I mean, you can use every part of your life to last, to produce fruit that is eternal, that touches heaven. You can use your possessions. You can use your connections. You can use your relationships. You can use the stuff you have. You can use it all to last. She said, I want, I want to give you meaning that lasts beyond this world. I don't want you to be a part of something that doesn't last. Let's be a part of something eternal. And then he says this, it's wild. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. That would mean our prayers would be different. That we would be praying for things that last. I mean, when was the last time you prayed for something that would last? Most of our prayers are temporary. And that doesn't mean that we shouldn't pray those prayers, that we shouldn't invite God into our prayers things in life that are temporary, but when was the last time that you really prayed for things that would last, things that touch eternity? When was the last time you prayed for somebody who was lost, that God would open up a conversation that this relationship you have been given would be used to help lead this, peop this person to follow Jesus? When was the last time you prayed for something that would touch eternity? 
Most of our prayers really aren't that powerful. We're just not praying for things that last. But when we pray for something that lasts, and when we persevere in that prayer, we'll see the Lord answer it. I've seen it. This past week, I saw an answer to prayer that I've been praying for a really long time. Something that would be eternal, I hope. That would last for eternity, impact eternity. So we pray for things that last. Maybe our prayer life should change. We're like, God doesn't answer our prayer. What are you praying? What are you looking for? Jesus said, I'm going to give you a powerful prayer life if you obey me and stay close to me. I'm going to give you joy. I'm going to let you bear fruit. You're going to have meaning in this world. You're going to touch eternity, and your prayers can be powerful. So let's learn to hate disobedience because it creates distance between us and the Lord. And let's press into loving Jesus by obeying him. And that would start with the way we love each other. This is how we live as followers of Jesus. Would you stand with me as we reflect on these things and respond? Let's take a moment as we do every week for you to consider what you will do with what you have heard. Jesus said, if you love me, maybe for a moment you would just tell him, I do love you. Tell them that you love them. Maybe it's been a while since you've heard that from you. Tell them. Is there disobedience in your life? You know that Jesus has told you to do something and you're not willing to do it. Or Jesus has told you to stop something to quit this, to no longer be a part of that, and you're not willing to do it. This disobedience is causing distance and stealing joy. Maybe today you would say, Jesus, I do love you, and I know you love me. I will obey you. I confess this. I repent. Maybe today you need to say, Jesus, would you teach me how to love people like you have loved me? Since it matters so much to you, would would you help me here? Show me what needs to change. Show me what you want me to do. I want to love people. I want to obey your command to love people like you love me. Is there something in your life that just needs to crucify? Jesus said, I'm going to go to the cross for you. I'm going to lay down my life for you. You're my friend. And because you're my friend, Jesus, I I will crucify this. I'm going to put this to death. Are you bearing fruit that will last? Got some great stuff here on this planet. It'll be gone when you are. You got anything that's touching eternity? It's touching the gospel, salvation in people's lives? Maybe today you would say, God, I want to be a part of this kind of bearing fruit. I know you appointed me to do this. You saved me and appointed me to bear fruit that will last. I want to. What do you, what do you want from me next? Maybe you're here today and you've heard about Jesus, sure, but you've resisted him before now, you've rejected him, but today you're ready to receive him. That's the spirit of God working in your spirit, drawing you to himself. Maybe today you would say, Jesus, I believe in you. I believe that you are God who became a man, who lived and died and rose again to pay for my sin, I believe in you. And I receive you. I am a sinner and you are the savior. Would you save me? Give me your spirit, I'll follow you. Jesus, thank you for this moment, this conversation that you, by your spirit, recorded for us in your scriptures so that we could live in it today. I pray that it would affect us. I pray that we as your followers would 
love you so much that we'll obey you. And we hate disobedience because it causes distance. And we know that the greatest joy in life is found from following you. I pray that you would produce fruit in us that will last. I pray that we'd be looking for and praying for and longing for connections to eternity in the lives of other people. We love you, Jesus, and we pray all of these things in your great name. Amen.